next speaker. For New York audiences, she is a well-known entity, and I have to say that I feel privileged to know her as friend, colleague. Um, our journeys, some in a way which she might share with you, uh, parallel. But Paola Antonelli clearly deserves a formal introduction, so I will do that while she stands in the back, in the corner, that's her thing. Formally trained as an architect at Milan's Polytechnical Institute, and for many years a journalist and editor, Paola Antonelli became a curator in MoMA's Department of Architecture in 1994, moving up in the ranks to her current position as senior curator in 2007 and director of the museum's recently established intriguing Department of Research and Development in 2012. Her approach to curatorial practice embodies the idea of game changer, taking risks, reimagining the, reimagining the role of design in the museum, how the museum can produce knowledge about design. She is constantly stretching the limits of curatorial thinking. A short list of exhibitions evokes that. Mutant Materials in Contemporary Design of 1994, Design in the Elastic Mind, 2008, Talk to Me, Design and Communication Between People and Objects of 2011, and a recent project, Applied Design, that is ongoing. But the list of projects that she has done on her CV goes on and on. Author of numerous publications, articles, a prolific writer, constantly in demand on the international lecture circuit, awarded Design Mind by the Cooper Hewitt in 2006, and the BGC's Iris Award in 2004. Please join me in welcoming the very unique and amazing Paola Antonelli. Thank you so much, Nina. This is, it is such a confusing introduction, like confusing in a nice way, and it's such a pleasure to be here because uh, I started at MoMA also 20 years ago in February, just a few months after <clears throat> the Bard was founded. So I feel that we grew up together, and it's such an amazing journey that I saw like flash by my eyes during Nina's presentation. So I want to congratulate Susan and Nina, and more recently also Pat for the great book. I mean, it really is an amazing feat what they've been able to accomplish. And the reason why we're all here in this room is because we love the real world. I mean, design and the decorative arts are one of the highest forms of human creative expression because they're not only about beauty, elegance, technology, accomplishments, but they're also for people, for the people. Even my colleague from the Rex Museum knows that everything that we do is for the real world. And that's why I decided to call this little presentation Exhibitions for the Real World Contemporary Design at MoMA. Of course, it's also a riff on the famous Victor Papanek book from, book from the 1970s, Design for the Real World, even though it doesn't uh, pertain, it doesn't keep the same kind of ideological uh, construct that he had in his book, which was so revolutionary. But when I started 20 years ago at MoMA, I realized that what music museums do is always to place whatever is their field of studies in the present and in the future. And because of my particular passion for contemporary design, I went back to look at some of the exhibitions that MoMA did since its founding in 1929, and that really were about positioning design in people's life, in the belief that, and this I'm quoting Alfred Barr Jr., the founding director of MoMA, that design was the opportunity that everybody had to have art in their lives. Of course, one of the first exhibitions that we always quote, that we always think about, is in the 1934 exhibition, Machine Art, by Philip Johnson. And it was, and, and Alfred Bauer, actually, they worked on it together. It was not the first design show for MoMA. I am pleased to say that also Philip Johnson had his trouble with the trustees and the exhibition boards. I was not the only one. So he presented it, he presented it to the board, uh, but the board was not feeling comfortable with it. So his first show in 1931 was furniture. And he was putting together like furniture that was like called from all the trustees home, including his mom's, with new furniture by the Bauhaus masters. So furniture was his first foray into design. But finally, in 1934, he was able to install machine art and the shock of the new and also the shock of design uh, which was not such a shock after all like 
took over the world. It was about placing the guts of objects on white pedestals against white walls as if they were Brancusi sculptures, and all of a sudden creating the distance that was necessary for people to look at design in a new way. Ever since, there's been an evolution, you know, a collection and the history of the museum is made of people. And people are amazing in their idiosyncrasies, in their passions, sometimes in their mistakes. It's very often that happens that we look in the warehouse, we find <clears throat> new troves of objects that we didn't know were there before, and we're like, what were they thinking? 26 pristini bowls? I will not get into details, but it's really interesting. <clears throat> but ever since, the uh, mission that MoMA curators um, have had was to make sure that design was a way for art to actually help the world go and move and progress and sometimes face difficulties. There was a famous series of exhibition, useful, useful Household Objects. It started out with under five, it went to under 10, and then Philip Johnson, as usual, uh, in the provocateur did one under $100, which at that time was a quite a hefty sum. But it was really great because uh, a precursor of the Good Design series that we'll talk about afterwards, it was about um, curators from MoMA just like going around the world, going into stores and finding objects that, uh, that represented the ideals of elegance and of beauty and at the same time functionality that they were preaching as modern. A very important tenet for all of us is that beauty is everybody's rights and it's uplifting. It's not an elitist addition to the world. It's something that is a human expression and that everybody should have access to. And most importantly, beauty does not cost more than ugliness. It's something that is demanded by an audience, a people that is educated and critical and can actually demand such standards. So in a way, you see this happening also at MoMA. Exhibitions like Organic Design in Home Furnishings from 1941 were also ways to introduce the idea of modernity to a wider audience. What is modern? It's very funny, but at MoMA we're always grappling with this <clears throat> attribute that is at the same time our blessing and our curse. It's our blessing because it enables us to be selective, to have smaller collection, to, make, to take stances. It's a curse because it always demands, begs for a redefinition. I remember once hearing Kirk Varnado uh, quoting somebody, and here's the problem, I don't remember who he quoted, and of course Kirk passed away, and I'm, I keep on giving this quote as apocry apocryphal, but if anybody can help me, please do. He said that modern is everything that does not hide the process of its making, which I find so beautiful. So that's what I've been seeking in design ever since, whether it's a piece of furniture, whether it is a whole interior, whether it is a system, whether it is an interface. I want to see the initial idea of the designer shine through until the very end in the final object. It's so difficult, we all know, you have to go through so much when you start with a perfect idea and you want to bring it into the world, that if you can still have that initial spark, that diamond in the final project, it's really a big accomplishment. And that's why also organic design in home furnishings was a way to introduce this honesty of modern living to the masses. And of course it became even more apparent after the Second World War when the founding of a new middle class and all the GIs coming back from the war enabled this new idea of modernity to really become the norm almost. Our clothes modern. Very interesting. I mean, there are so many exhibitions that we can talk about in the history of MoMA, but lately I've been looking, I've been rereading the catalog of this great show by Bernard Rudofsky that criticized uh, Dior's new look and all of the uncomfortable pieces of clothing. It was a very moralistic exhibition, sometimes a little pedantic, but incredibly interesting. And it was one way to show how curators at MoMA really tried to help and try to suggest new directions for what was going on in the world. The Good Design series I mentioned to you, it was a collaboration between the curators at MoMA and the Merchandise Mart in Chicago. What I also liked about contemporary design shows at MoMA early on was that there was no hypocrisy. One of the beauty of design, one of the great aspects of design was that you could buy it, that it was commercial. And the catalog of exhibitions at MoMA usually carried the price of the object and where you could buy it. 
Now, of course, it's a different world. You know, there are many prices, there are many uh, purchase points, but I really liked the fact that commerce was not considered dirty. And once again, design is the opportunity to have art in the real world. So this collaboration with the Merchandise Mart was perfectly legit. There was an exhibition once a year in Chicago, an exhibition once a year in New York, and there were the commercial experts of the Mart and the curators at MoMA going around stores in the United States and picking up hairbrushes, pots and pans, you name it, and showing them as great examples of design to the masses. <clears throat> I'm going to jump a few years because otherwise we're going to stay here forever. <laughs> but it's fantastic, you know, if you have time to go through all these shows. 1971, Emilio Ambast's show, Italy, the New Domestic Landscape, which was an exhibition in which a new idea... <clears throat> really of living was presented those were well, the golden years of italian design and it was a show that was a little bit like machine art in the groundbreaking vein in the real trailblazing vein because it showed a new way of living and also a new way to interpret technology emilio was also responsible for another show that really was about reality which is the taxi project realistic solutions for today in 1976 this show really addressed by also commissioning objects and that's another aspect of contemporary design shows and museums. Sometimes you can commission new ideas. It commissioned visions for the taxis of that time and we know that Parsons recently did a similar show that was about, I think recently because I have no sense of time, it must be seven or eight years ago at this point, about a new taxi project. Information Art, another example of a great exhibition by my colleague Karen McCarty who's now at the Cooper Hewitt <coughs> that like machine art took the guts well these were uh, the meta guts of uh, machines and showed them as objects of great beauty at that time um, uh, informatic and electronic engineers used to check on microchips efficiency by printing out this hugely magnified diagrams and basically looking at them as if they were urban planning uh, drawings to see and to make sure that everything fit. And these diagrams are the ones that Cara decided to show. I'm going to go now to my experience at MoMA, not all the shows at all, but just the few with which I tried to channel the, uh, the curators of the past and I tried to really pursue this agenda for the museum. I have my stopwatch here that I want to make sure, yeah, I want to make sure that I don't let you uh, wait for my next speaker any longer than necessary. But Mutant Materials in Contemporary Design, which N Nina so kindly reminded you of, was my first show at MoMA. And it was uh, a, an exhibition in which I was trying to share with the public what I thought was one of the most amazing aspects of design at that time, which is a little bit the leitmotif of so many contemporary design curators. I was trying to show a big shift in the way materials were used in design. Um, it used to be that as a designer, if you wanted to do a plastic chair, you would have to find somebody that could invest fifty to $70,000 in a mold made of steel or aluminum for injection molding. It, it was a big deal. You could not make a prototype. You could make models, but not prototype unless you could invest a lot of money. And instead, at that time, in the 1990s, new materials and new resins especially made it much easier to, for instance, mold plastic at ambient temperature using composite molds, um, or even make composite of fibers and resins. All of a sudden, <coughs> the center of gravity of the design of materials had gone from chemical companies and engineers to the designer's office. So the designer was in control of even more of the concept and of the process of making. I wanted to show an audience as wide as possible how fabulous this new universe was. That's what happens with so many design shows when you are in a place like MoMA. You're talking always to many different audiences, but it's not difficult to actually um, engage all of them. In particular, two I always think of. One is the wide audience of the museum and uh, the people that come very often to take vitamins of Matisse and Picasso because the doctor prescribed them. And then they stumble upon a design show and they stay there for two hours because it is so sexy and it's so interesting and it is about their life. Uh, so that's one of the audiences, of course. And the other 
other audience that really means a lot to me is the design community. I want to make sure that every exhibition gives either more ground under experimental designers' feet or establishes a new baseline that they can confront themselves with. So these two audiences are always very much there in my mind. To address the wide audience of MoMA, very simply, it was about showing great examples of design either made with innovative, in, innovative materials or made with new innovative ways to use old materials. And the exhibition was great, uh, was very uh, scenographic. At that time, I was still so new at MoMA, so they even let me use carpet, which I couldn't afford anymore ever since, but my first show, they let me use carpet. And another thing that they let me do was to let people touch the objects. We were talking before, you know, also my colleague from the Rijksmuseum talked about the fact that people usually cannot touch things in museums and now we're trying to let them touch things at home or to let them have other means to have a haptic experience and a direct experience of art. In that case, uh, also because it was designed, I had a lot of spare parts, I could let people touch all of these great materials or almost all of them. It was um, quite a wonderful way to actually introduce even more of an explanation. If Philip Johnson in 1934 had to create this crevice between people and objects, everyday objects, so as to make sure that they were looked at in a different way, ever since, because of the evolution of culture, curators have labored in order to fill the gap, explain more, show the process. So this was an ultimate way to try and get people closer to the objects. Sometimes contemporary design um, takes traditional appearances, like in a monographic show. I usually don't um, like monographic shows because they make me, especially if the person is alive, they, make me, they force me to have to deal with another human being and design, which is not, not easy. And you know, Nina knows, having dealt with Sheila, for instance, what that means, you know, Sheila especially. So Castiglioni was my teacher. And uh, he, he gave me really low grades. I mean, really, he was terrible as a teacher, and uh, even though he was great as a lecturer. And that was my revenge, a monographic show in which I told him that he couldn't do and decide and say anything because it was an homage uh, of the museum to him. But to make a long story short, Castiglioni was a monographic show, of course, but it was a way to explain the amazing richness of design because Castiglioni is somebody that has a story behind every design project. So it was important for me to use his objects as ways for people to understand where design comes from. You know, I don't care when people ask me what the difference is between design and art. That's not the point. The point is to understand how design is born and even how art is born. So in that case, um, I was looking for a new way to communicate with the audiences and I said, okay, if I want to tell a story, how do I do it? People are not going to sit there or stand there and read, read, read. Well, maybe if I have really good pictures, they're going to look at the pictures first and then read. So that's what I decided to do. I went to Stephen Guarnaccia, who's an illustrator that I had worked in the past with at Abitare, and asked him to produce an illustration for each object of the Castiglione exhibition. Just to tell you a very, a, a very small example, the, um, the switch, the electrical switch that became so ubiquitous in Italy. Achille said that he studied not only the form, not only the way it was made, but re he really designed the sound, that the click of the sound was so important for him. That's why the switch is in a birdcage and the character that was consistent throughout the illustrations is listening to it. So all of these illustrations made sure that people stopped and actually read the story, which was a way to once again explain more about design. In 2001, <coughs> it was a strange moment for technology and for the way people worked. The dot-com boom about to go bust, all of these introduction of new technologies, the dawn of wireless technology that nonetheless never worked, or you would travel and you would always miss the plug that was necessary, or this, you had to dial home to the server and the line was interrupted. So it was a moment of great promise and great frustration. And that's why we decided to explore the new way in which people work on an, in an exhibition that was, of course, a survey of a lot of products already on the market, but also, more importantly, it was 
was um, a series of six commissions that were based on critical issues about contemporary work. What I did is I assembled a panel, a scientific committee, very, <laughs> very normal word in Italy, scientific committee of experts, and together we decided to find six big issues. Why six? Because I had money only for six. Sometimes all of these like amazing, you know, numbers, they just come from very pragmatic decisions. And then we assigned the issues to different designers. For instance, top left, Naoto Fukasawa, at that time he was still working with IDEO, uh, American but also very deeply Japanese. One of the questions was, if you're stuck in a cubicle, how do you make your uh, your space expand and we thought that a Japanese would definitely know about very small enclosed spaces and sure enough he did this beautiful project called Personal Skies in which an OLED screen on top of your head finds projected onto it beautiful skies in motion so you can have a friend from Vienna send you the sunset in Vienna or other types of sky but so it was a way to have a hole in your ceiling on the right hand side you can look at the commission by Hella Jongerius. Hella was given the task of thinking about working at home instead of working in the office. At that time, there was a lot of fear about working at home. People were saying that you, have to, you had to simulate a commute around the block in the morning, or you had to change your clothes, or you had to put your computer on timers so at nine o'clock at night they would turn off and you couldn't turn them on until the day after. And Hella, with her usual Dutch deadpan attitude said, you know what, people are not stupid, they know when to work and when not to work. And she did the opposite. She, wo she wove together all the technology that would enable one to choose whether to work or to have a family life using technology. And then at the bottom, Marty Guichet, another really interesting designer that was talking about working while you're traveling. And he said, instead of having a laptop or other technology, the best way to work well while you travel is to travel well and to really get to know people, to make do of the situation at your disposal to expand your culture. So you can see that um, it's great for a curator when uh, he or she can use the power and the authority of the platform at her disposal to give a little bit back by, uh, by sometimes harnessing the best minds of design currently available. The exhibition Safe was another way to look at reality. Interestingly, it was an exhibition about design and safety, but it started out as an exhibition about design and emergency. It started out in 1991, and then it was frozen after September 11, 2001, because I freaked out. You know, For five days after 9-11, I didn't even think of the show until Julie Yovine, who at that time was uh, at the New York Times, told me, hey, what about your exhibition? My exhibition was about triage centers, it was about ambulances, it was about fire trucks, and when she told me, I felt my stomach fall to my knees, and I said, I don't even, I don't even want to touch that exhibition. So it took a few years, and a strange switch from the idea of emergency to the other side of the glass, of the mirror, which is safety, to come to this exhibition, which explored the natural tendency that designers have to work to make people's lives safer and more comfortable all over the world. And this exhibition led me to one of the um, principles that I always quote about design. I always say that designers almost take a Hippocratic oath when they decide to become designers. Even when they show dystopian projects or concepts, they're always working towards the betterment of society as if, as if they were homeopathic doctors. So it was really an important show for me because it led me to understand so much more about design. And that's also why not only contemporary, also historical design shows are continuous enrichment for curators. In the meantime, the collection was growing and we were exploring also new fields. This is the first exhibition that we did about uh, digitally produced design. It was called Digitally Mastered and it was in 2006. And those were already acquisitions. We were acquiring 3D printed objects like Patrick Juin's chair on the platform and also our first interaction design collection item which is John Maida's reactive books. So we were testing also these new acquisitions because once again contemporary design presented us as curators and as museum educators with a new set of challenges and we would jump into the pool 
gleefully. <laughs> Design and the Elastic Mind happened in 2008. Once again, a great learning process for me. It was an exhibition about design and science. It came from the idea that designers are fundamental enzymes in the innovation process because revolutions might happen in science, technology, and other fields, but without designers, these revolutions would never become reality and would never become life. Microwaves would not become ovens. The internet would not become interfaces that my grandmother can use by, by clicking buttons and windows. It would all remain rarefied and not available to everybody. So it was an exhibition that was quite experimental, not only because we threw together designers and scientists, but also because um, it was not a typical MoMA show in that it didn't present canon. It didn't present a closed, firm, and finished concept. It was a little bit like critical design, a what if. Uh, kind of an exhibition. It was very scary for me because until the day before it opened, I could not sleep at night thinking it would be a complete flop because I had left myself vulnerable, not knowing exactly what the answer to the question was. That's where I learned that if you do so, as Frank Gehry says, all buildings when, are so much better when they're not finished with their construction sites. The same with exhibitions. In today's day and age, maybe not in the 30s, maybe not in the 50s, but now, if you leave something for people to finish up with you, for your audiences to suggest, it's so much better for you and for the audiences. It's really interesting. So you're seeing here, there was also a live object. You see up there, top left, that was alive. That was a little coat that was made of my stem cells that was in an incubator with nutrients. And at some point, it grew too much, so I had to stop the incubator. I had to kill the coat. And that also kept me up at night, because I felt like I was the governor of Texas having to decide whether to put to death the little coat. <laughs> it was really strange. But so designing the elastic mind was was a great process also for me because it, uh, it it taught me that contemporary design is also about this idea of open source this idea of sharing and this idea of participating and coming to terms with an audience in a different way talk to me was a little even more about dialogue you know it was an, about the fact that objects not only mean but also talk to us you know so we've always had a relationship with objects whether heirloom objects whether um, objects that are endearing or that remind us of something but now especially children we expect to have a dialogue with objects and if the interface is there or not we want it to be there <coughs> so this whole exhibition was about physical objects, it was about interfaces, it was about websites, it was about information design. It was about showing to our audiences what, what, once again what they already knew because of their everyday experience by giving them also a sense of the best examples. Sometimes that's what we do as contemporary design curators. We hold up a very selective mirror. We take reality and we show the best of it so that people can have a distilled sense of the kind of beauty and the kind of elegance, which means also more clarity and more functionality that we're all aspiring to. So Talk To Me had that kind of idea. And the same was happening parallel in the collection. We started acquiring digital fonts and showing people what digital fonts are, how they can be adapted, how they can be designed, how they become ubiquitous without you even noticing. You know, we had collected Matthew Carter's Verdana. We had collected so many of the fonts that people use every day, including the Bell Centennial for the yellow pages of New York City. Born Out of Necessity is an exhibition that, also from the collection, that showed a very overt example of critical design. Critical design um, has, not, um, has not been invented 10 years ago. It's existed forever. If you go back to the 1960s, so much of the conceptual designs by architects and other practitioners at that time were about thinking of the future, thinking of possible consequences of choices made today. And that's what critical design is even now. You're looking here at the work by Tony Dunn and Fiona Raby called Foragers, which talks about a possible future in which there's a gigantic shortage of food. We know that it's already going in that direction. And therefore, um, people need to start 
need to go back to eating and digesting things that they have not eaten and digested for millennia, such as roots, such as leaves, such as algae. And Tony and Fiona, of course, these are models, almost sculptures, have thought of these kind of outsourced gastrointestinal systems that one can wear in order to pre-digest algae in this case, <laughs> leaves in that case, roots in that other case. So the function of this design is not far from the function of some art, which is to make you think deeply about your current state and the future possibilities thereof. So um, we like to collect also this type of design and to show it to amplify people's understanding of this vague and slippery word design. And lately, we've been also collecting video games, which proved, uh, proved to be uh, controversial and interestingly so, because it sparked a whole conversation about the idea of interaction design. And that's what you can also see at MoMA right now. You can play them. So it's important to position these objects in the museum because it's like machine art. Once again, people stop and think differently. That's why the video games are so important in that setting, and that's why it's important to choose the right ones, because it's a way to make people understand more about design. And the latest experiment, which just launched two days ago, is not even physical yet. It's called Design and Violence, and it's a website in which we are presenting, I say we, because I'm doing this with Jamer Hunt, who's the chair of the Transdisciplinary Design Program at Parsons New School of Design, and with my great curatorial assistant, Kate Carmody. What we've done is we've uh, decided to try and explore the contemporary manifestations of violence in society by using objects that have an ambiguous relationship with it. This was all sparked by the publication a year and a half ago of Steven Pinker's book, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature. I don't know if anybody has read it. I had been thinking about design and violence for a while, but that book, which was very scholarly and serious, like there's no tomorrow, and was arguing by looking at statistics and data that our society is becoming less violent, that book gave me pause. And I am not analytical, I'm not able to really use data, and I am good at using instinct and design objects. So I decided to try and see and look at the um, at violence today by looking at objects. So I started looking for objects such as, for instance, the, the US Army is developing these green bullets that are lead free, so they will be safe for the environment, even though they will still kill you. Um, you know, so there's many objects like that. You know. Or I remember the first time, I don't know about you, but the first time I heard about the 3D printed gun, my jaw dropped. I'm so naive. I always think that any technology and any form of design is only going to be for the good. And all of a sudden, somebody was using 3D printers to make guns that could be made by anybody and assembled. So that kind of shock is what I want to communicate with this site. Um, and what we are doing is we're picking the objects. And of course, we're publishing the objects with all kind of museum quality labels and uh, you know information, etc. But we're also asking people who know about violence because they've either studied it or uh, described it or experienced it. We're asking them to talk about these objects, to write about these objects. And you see here, for instance, we have asked Anne-Marie Slaughter. You cannot read it very well, but Anne-Marie Slaughter is that amazing journalist that last year published that controversial article about whether women can have it all or not on the Atlantic. She also used to be at the Department of State, and she's an expert in international affairs, and also studies a lot violence on women in, in different countries in the world. We assigned to her the scent of violence, which is this object, well, this scent distilled by Cecil Tolas. Cecil Tolas is a great scent artist. She went to cage fights and she picked up all the towels after the cage fight and using perfume technology, headspace technology, she distilled that disgusting scent. I mean, really, it stinks, it's horrible. And she made it into the scent of violence. So we sent Anne-Marie in Princeton an ampoule of that scent. She gagged. <laughs> but she wrote a beautiful piece, which is there. Uh, William Gibson wrote about Trevor Paglin's five classified aircraft, which is the black ops world and their insignia. And then we have Steven Pinker himself that wrote about the million dollar blocks. And what we do is we solicit comments from people in order to make the conversation happen and to really uh, see whether we can all together, once again, 
the curators, the authors, the designers, and the public understand more about violence. We're posting two objects a week at the beginning, then once every week thereafter. And at some point, we also want to introduce a world map that shows where you'll be able to find the objects physically. For instance, one of the objects will be the mine cafon, the mine detonator, which happens to be at MoMA right now, so you'll see it there. Also, we're hoping that like Bard, you know, it was beautiful when uh, Nina was talking about how Bard became a universal donor. You know, also, what's the blood group, o, o minus or O plus that is the universal donor? But that's how I always think about it. It became the universal donor for so many other institutions. We're hoping that this website will become a universal donor for people that want to discuss these topics. For instance, last week or two weeks ago, there was a Google summit, which was about technology, communication technology in conflict areas. And they they asked us to present some of the objects there. We know that um, other um, institutions want to do something. So we're just hoping to become really a knot for this, a node for this kind of conversation. And you see some of the objects that are coming up are indeed the 3D printed gun. Rob Walker, who's a great writer um, of design and branding, is going to write about it. And it's going to be posted on Monday. I'm going to, I've told you about the green bullets there to the side bottom right, and then you can see the mine detonator top left, and this beautiful uh, work by, by James Bridle, which was a way to kind of draw the shadow of drones onto the floor, onto the sidewalk of villages and cities in England to make Western people feel what it means to be in a drone infested or a drone, you know, a drone area. So it's really quite a powerful way, and it's an experiment, and it's an experiment that is based on design. It does away for a moment with physicality but wants to get back to it afterwards in order to do what we do all the time as experts and as lovers of design to understand better this form of human creativity in order to make to position better bases for the future thank you very much